Theater Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY. My name is Frank Henschke, and I'm the Director of Programs and Executive Director of a center that bridges academia and professional theater, but mostly also international and American theater with the home of the Prelude Festival as well as the Penwell Voices Festival. And um, in uh, our work, which we have done here over a decade, uh, also the work of circus and circus performance has been central. We have done a couple of events. We consider it as a most significant art form that is uh, in a dialogue that becomes more and more significant. And as I said earlier, we feel very strongly that this is a form that comes even more from the future than from the past. Most of the time or often we speak about the past when it comes to theater and performance, but the work of circus, contemporary circus and performance and the uh, truly uh, uh, astonishing uh, uh, collaborations, whether it comes to opera, ballet, site-specific work, and others is truly at the forefront of what we haven't seen, we haven't known about yet, and it's an experiment in the sense of an experiment that you don't know often what comes out. We are extremely proud here at the Siegel Center, and I really mean it uh, to have had this day here and with us tonight, extraordinary <coughs> artists in uh, chess, they would be grandmasters of the game. They are the Boris Spassky's and Boris Fisher's and, uh, of the game. And um, it's really uh, lucky also that we have uh, uh, them with us tonight. And I uh, would like to thank very much my co-curators, uh, uh, Ruth Wickler and um, Patrick, uh, who helped us to put this together. We are also celebrating the publication of his book on contemporary circus and performance. So it's an, uh, truly... Uh, a day which I think rivals uh, most probably anything you will see in all the Americas for this year, but perhaps and for sure in Canada, this is uh, uh, this is uh, a much more uh, 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 a much more uh, customary uh, view to really have a circus as part of the uh, contemporary dialogue. Hans Thies Lehmann, who was here, uh, who wrote the post-traumatic theater book, did say. The theater is a house, and a house has many rooms, and in this house, here for us, but also in general, I think circus has a very, very big, large, large space. And we are going to look at this much uh, closer. To have a yarn with us, Sean, Gypsy, and Jennifer uh, is uh, extraordinary. We are incredibly lucky that this worked out. And um, again, we would like to uh, uh, express our thank, and they're all here. The format of the evening will be that Ruth will talk a bit about the organization she now works for. It's this Tohu in Montreal, Canada, a most significant organization I didn't know enough about. And then Yaron, Sean, Gypsy, and Jennifer will talk about their works, all about 10 minutes at a time. Patrick will talk about the book. He worked with two other co-curators, uh, co-editors. Um, he is at the Concordia University in Montreal. What, uh, what he found out and what surprised him and uh, what answers or best new questions he has. And um, then we will have a discussion here on the panel about uh, contemporary work for theater performance in the context of circus work. Perhaps our questions will be coming a little bit more from the scholarly side, uh, but uh, it's a great, uh, a significant, and uh, I think uh, um, also meaningful dialogue. And we hope it's just the beginning, the afternoon panel. I don't know if you were here, already said perhaps there should be a collective, there should be a bigger push also in the New York City scene to connect with the Philadelphia scene or Montreal. And I hope that this uh, event today is a small um, contribution. There will be a little reception here afterwards, so I hope you will stay in case you have additional questions. We will not be able to get to all the questions even in the afternoon. We went, I think, almost uh, 40 minutes over time, and there were more uh, creative people who could not ask their questions, so I hope you will forgive us. But uh, as you saw before the event started, everybody is talking to each other, and this is a significant and meaningful in itself. Um, if you have a cell phone, now is the moment. Take it out and make sure the ringer is off. I'll do the same. <coughs> and, um, and now I am uh, going to uh, ask Ruth to start off and tell us a bit about Tohu, the organization you work for, what it's all about. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Frank, for making space for this topic uh, in the Siegel Center program. And thanks to our amazing panelists for being part of this and to Patrick for collaborating. <laughs> I was taking photos. Uh, we are also live streaming on HowlRound at the moment. So this is a, a dialogue that will not only be witnessed by you, but also by anyone who's looking on the internet uh, for the appropriate address, HowlRound.com. And if you, you can text that to people. Doesn't it, it stays on the, on the online right after. Um, so I am a, a sort of connecting link here because I've worked with Frank for many years before um, becoming a, a 
programmer of contemporary theater and performance, and then eventually becoming a programmer of circus um, at Tohu in Montreal. So uh, Frank has given me a little platform to kind of explain what I do. Um, so thank you for that. Can we do the um, first slide? Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> and also I do come from a circus background as an artist uh, originally as well. Uh, it was part of the circus community here in New York um, quite a number of years ago. Uh, so my job now is called uh, the French, the translation of the French is that I'm the deputy director of programming, <laughs> development, and touring of circus arts. And what's interesting uh, about that title is that um, it's not just circus arts in a particular place, but it's circus arts as a discipline, which reflects the institution I'm working for, which has the mission to promote circus and contemporary circus as an art form. Um, and also I'm working on development of the art form and on programming for the venue I work with and then on um, helping the art form to tour uh, more in North America. Next slide. So I wanna give a little bit of overview of contemporary circus as an art form. Um, at the 4 p.m. panel, we talked more about our my kind of ur urban ecosystems for contemporary circus in New York City and Philadelphia. These are artist communities. Um, and this is a much broader overview. Um, so contemporary circus is a performing arts discipline like theater, like dance, and has the infinite variety therein, um, which is an invitation never to be reductive about contemporary circus and to say it is one thing or another thing. Um, it has many characteristics Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I, and actually, uh, Patrick, as a scholar, will do more analysis um, and has more uh, smarter things to say about the, the art form than I, than I will go into. But I do want to just say that there are, it's an international art form. Um, and there are countries that provide more, su more support for the development of the art form than, than others. And it's an art form that has special needs in terms of space, equipment, um, emergency service, you know, healthcare, um, all kinds of things. So there's some, some countries have decided that this is a, a national imperative to support um, creation, training, development, uh, touring of the art form, and some countries haven't. And, and um, so the countries that have are some of the ones that I've listed in, in the top section and regions. And then um, when I say, when I wrote emerging sectors, uh, that is basically saying that there's a lot of really strong, talented creators and artists making work, but maybe the country isn't providing that kind of uh, support. And so from these countries, you often see a lot of uh, migration. So artists that are like brain drain artists who migrate to the countries on the top because of the levels of support that are available. Of course, that is a, you know, Leaving, a con leaving your own place to go somewhere else is a big cost. But um, it's, it's just a sort of a fact that that's, I would say, tr more true in circus than in other performing arts disciplines because the needs are greater and more specific for circus. Um, thank you. So Montreal is currently, uh, which is where I'm based at the moment, is um, a global capital of contemporary circus. And I just, talking with Patrick, elaborated some of the reasons why or some of what makes that true. Um, and we talked at four about the idea of an ecosystem. And so I think in Montreal, there's, there's a quite an amazing ecosystem. So I just wanted to, to hear elaborate some of the components of the ecosystem. Um, so it's not only is it thriving companies that both show commercial success and also nonprofit success, um, the, the uh, there's a ripple effect of having those companies based in the city, which is that so much, um, so many resources are present, similarly to film in Hollywood, the resources are there, present. Um, the National Circus School of Canada was founded in 1981. It's extremely good. Um, and again, circus training takes a lot of special equipment, special knowledge, coaching, and they provide that. Um, the student body is 60% Canadian, 40% international, and again, the students are staying in the community after, after they graduate, so that creates that pipeline. Um, 
I'm not going to read out the next paragraph, but it basically says that with the Ministry of Culture at the city level, province level, even national level of Canada, the, um, the amount of not only just dollar and numbers, but also strategy, the way that a Ministry of Culture can str look strategically at the needs of an art sector and support that art sector um, is extraordinary in North America. It's much more the European model. Um, and then, as we discussed earlier, the, uh, having a venue that is dedicated to circus is a, an important component of an ecosystem. So Tohu, where I'm currently working, is um, was uh, opened in 2004, so it's just f uh, celebrated 15 years of presenting contemporary circus year-round and in a summer festival. Um, and its offer is to be a home for Quebec companies, so to take risks on presenting premieres of um, Quebec companies. Uh, Tohu, as I'll explain, is quite large, so physically. So it's, uh, so it's best for larger productions, but um, having in it, its uh, summer festival presents work of many different scales. And then finally, there's all the dialogue, and I forgot to put journalism in here as well, but research, scholarship, documentation, library, museum collections, um, discourse, history, talking, reflecting, um, and also the other thing I forgot is en piste, as you mentioned earlier, a professional association of circus, professional circus artists as well. So those are journalism and, and uh, professional service, uh, artist association are two things missing. And maybe Gypsy, you can add, um, if I left out any key things. But the, it's a complex ecosystem that supports the development and sustainability of an art form. And having um, paid employment in the performance is a really important component of that. So even if you could say, well, you know, Cirque du Soleil is a sort of large corporate entity, it does provide paid employment for quite a lot of artists. Next, next slide. So I am working at Tohu. Um, next slide. And this is the inside of it. It's a round venue. Um, these are its contexts. Gypsy knows it much better than I know. <laughs> so funny you there. It's the only one in North America. Yep. Um, so the, the, the story is that in, the, in 1999, um, the Professional Artists Association, uh, Circus Artists Association got together with the um, National Circus School of Canada and Cirque du Soleil and proposed um, creating a campus called the city, Cir Circus Arts City, um, which is located in the north of Montreal. And Tohu as a building is the kind of, um, is, the, is the venue that welcomes the public onto that campus. And so um, the National Circus School is right next door. The world headquarters of Cirque du Soleil are right next door. Those, those, they don't have an opening to the public, but we are kind of the town gown relations uh, venue. And we are also next to a giant dump that stopped accepting trash in 2000 and has been being redone as a park since then and is officially opening fully in 2025, but just last year opened um, partially to the public. So part of our job at Tohu is to animate the, the park. And, um, and then we're also next door to um, basically the Jackson Heights of uh, Montreal called Saint-Michel, which just in 2009 got the first designation in North America of uh, little, not like Little Italy, Little Maghreb. Little North Africa. Um, next slide. Oh, my G fell to the bottom. <laughs> um, <laughs> this happens with uh, PowerPoint. Anyway, um, so what do we do in this beautiful venue? We do, uh, we welcome Contemporary Circus uh, productions um, for a full season and then in the summer festival. And we also do quite a lot of programming that is less well known in the circus world, which is to, um, we're, we're a uh, officially sanctioned city cultural center for our neighborhood. So that means offering a whole slate of free multidisciplinary family programming events and participatory activities for our neighborhood. And this is again what you have when you have a ministry of culture, you have 
um, this idea that each neighborhood should have a cultural center that has cultural offer. And so our contract with the city, <laughs> our contract with the city includes, um, does that mean I'm done? Okay, I'll talk really fast. Anyway, you can read basically all the things on this slide. Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> So this are, these are just, you don't have to absorb all this, just know that there are really wonderful numbers related to how many people we've reached and how many things we've done. Next slide. Uh, we have a summer festival. It's really big, over 400,000 people attend, outdoors, indoors, all over the city. Um, and we have an international circus market for professionals and researchers that we work with, uh, Concordia. And everyone is invited to take the very short trip up to Montreal for the festival. Um, next summer, and the market if you are a circus professional. Next slide. Oh, this is the, the trailer from last summer's festival, just to give you an eyeful. So what, one thing you can see about our marketing department is, is uh, appealing to audiences who are used to coming to other disciplines to say, hey, look, we are crossing disciplines. So two of the, our panelists' work is in the video. So that's exciting. Okay, next slide. Oh, that's our website. .ca is Canada. Yes. <laughs> So I, I, uh, I actually don't want to take any more time because everyone else on the panel is quite as ex extraordinary and um, so I'll be done. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Ruth. So really, something we all should be know, know more about and I think we should go to the Theatre Festival and visit. Um, Yaron, um, I would like to ask you, who came here from Australia, as happened to be in town and to uh, his famous Circa organization, and he's really one of the great, great directors in the world working for circus and performance and theater. Thank you for really for being here. True story. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, nine minutes to talk about life, circus, art, theater, poetry. The reasons why and the reasons why not is not a lot. So I'm going to possibly just overload you with things. I can't promise where it's going to land up. Nine minutes, what's it about? I don't know. I thought from the fringes of Empire sounded a little pretentious, but not altogether inaccurate. <laughs> so before I, I completely uh, give, g g g uh, lose all my credibility, I love this quote. Today that art can only be made from the starting point of that which as far as Empire is concerned doesn't exist. Now, there's no place more further removed from empire than the circus. Right? The circus is kind of anti-empire. So we get reviews all the time that say, I'm sure you guys do as well, what's this, what's this, why is there juggling at the mat? And is it amazing how this thing somehow, with a play or a site-specific thing, manages to be moving, poetic, beautiful? Isn't, isn't that extraordinary? It would be great not to get those reviews, right? It'd be great to get reviews that said, well, of course, this is, what, this is this art form full of extraordinary people doing beautiful, amazing, heroic things on a daily basis. But I, worry that it, I also worry that if that were to happen, we might become part of empire, and then people would expect that, and then we would atrophy. So I don't think any of these things for me are completely simple. I come from Brisbane, Australia, which is about as far from empire as you can get. We are the edge of the edge. And that has given us an extraordinary freedom to be ignorant of and ignore most things. Um, <laughs> I'll, show you a little, I'll show you a little clip. Um, hopefully this plays. You're not getting sound up there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So this is the piece that we've just had in New York. It's from the, this was the premiere season. Um, and I guess it just kind of... Yeah. It's marketing, they pick the good bits. Um, uh, but that's their job. Um, I love this quote from James Baldwin, that the purpose of art is to lay bare the questions which have been hidden by the answers. I think one of the things that I've understood a lot about circus was that when I started, and I don't come from circus and can't claim any genuine... Uh, I've had to learn everything on the job. I've been a kind of 20-year work experience boy. Um, that there were a lot of people who told me how things had to be. You couldn't put these kinds of acts together. You couldn't do that this way or this way. And so, again, coming from the edge of empire, coming from not the place where it was always done properly, we didn't have to listen to that. And that was a great liberating thing. It allowed us to be iconoclastic, punk, poetic, whatever we felt like, um, and not do things by the rules. And so one of the things that we do that I encourage people when I teach or when I work with, um, with students in all capacities is to say, look, we, what we're going to teach you is only what's known, right? We, your job is to find the new questions, the, the kind of stronger and more interesting propositions. Um, I just want to show you a tiny excerpt from the opera that we've just, we've just opened. This, was, this particular scene got a really bad review, got singled out by a critic who hates me. Um, as a piece of... It was called egregious, which is a pretty strong word. Egregious. Egregious. Oh. <laughs> so that's sort of meant to be her, and in my mind this was a kind of forest tree kind of world that she was crossing. And he's been singing about how sad he is for about 10 minutes now. This is not new information. <laughs> but this trick was seen as being somehow denigrating the art of opera and the quality of his mourning. So, just to show you that that's what marketing probably doesn't want me to show you. Um, Martha Graham said that the body never lies. And I think circus work is always based in the truth that the body brings. And that truth is not a single truth, it's probably a misnomer, it's the truths or the, the questions that the body brings. Um, I've learned a lot, most of the things I've learned are by opening my eyes and looking at what's in front of me um, and allowing myself to be surprised by its poetics, by its density, by its contradictions. Um, Circa is known as a place that's gender blind. We, have, we don't have slightly different in things like operas where you're trying to tell a fairly codified story, but even so, we're able to bend it. But we don't have male and female roles. It's about ability. It's about um, preference. It's not based in... It's based in the essential truths that are housed in these things that we have that are called bodies. We work in... Um, th we do a lot of work in theatres, and some of the work that we're doing, like on Mass and the Opera that I've shown you, are both kind of fairly posh pieces. They're designed to kind of upsell us to Empire, and the re great thing about Empire is that it pays. Um, I was... We were... Normally, when we work, it's me and a computer and a couple of screens, but I've just been spent a, a month making an opera and I've had three stage managers, an assistant director, uh, an associate circus director, a video designer, a line designer there the whole time. I've had understudies. Like, it's been incredible and it's such a blast. People write down things so that you can remember them. <laughs> like, it's amazing. So I love that. It's great. And it's beautiful to visit. But it's not a world that I want to live in. The world I want to live in is the world of people making beautiful, powerful things wherever they are. So we do a lot of work, we're at the same time as I'm working on that, we're working on a project with 60 Down Syndrome kids and a, a symphony orchestra. We're doing the first ever circus setting of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. We're doing a project in, uh, in February, these three projects all happen, happen unfortunately in February next year, of our show Leviathan, which is 18 circus artists, the, almost our whole ensemble, with 18 community members, a project that we embed to teaching artists in a community for six weeks before we open and it's a big new creation. So we work from the kind of high-end posh stuff to, I'll just show you, this is a sort of trailer of Peep Show for Works. This is um, the sort of less of the posh stuff. 
Uh, but a show that I'm incredibly proud of because it takes cabaret, takes it to the nightclub and then blows it right open um, in a way that I thought would not would never work. And um, I think the... Just keep talking as that's going because we're going to run out of time. But I think that the interesting thing for me is that at the core of this, that questioning and that doubt and fear about will it work is incredibly powerful. It's a driver of every artist that I know. Um, uh, let's not stuff this up, or slightly ruder variations of that seem to be essentially mottos or driving forces for us. Um, I really love, I came across this. Uh, Technology is not my strong suit. Um, this was a W.S. Merwin quote that I particularly liked. It came across the other day. I asked how you can be sure, he's asked talking to the poet John Berryman, that what you write is really any good at all. And he said, you can't, you can't. You can never be sure you die without knowing whether anything you wrote was any good. If you have to be sure, don't write. <laughs> um, I really love that thought that if you have to be sure, don't do it. The, 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 que the constant questioning, if truth is out there, it definitely will not be found by knowing what it is when you start. And I love the, the idea that we should, we should have these kind of bitter, obstinate questions that we have at our heart. What makes this work? Why, why is that thing in the air? How high should it be? That every single part of what we do is already rich with poetry and meaning. And our job, in a way, is to stop that or interrupt it long enough to learn what it might be able to tell us. Circus work has a lot to do with restriction and obstacle. It has to do with interruption. So by breaking things, by making them harder, by adding resistance or tension or obstacle or questions, um, we create things that are from the circus but no longer look or feel like the circus. Um, I, I'm very conscious that most of the things that I do, it's very difficult to talk about empire as a kind of middle-aged white male. Um, so I, I, I think that it's particularly good to, um, <laughs> to note that uh, I come to you kind of late in the middle of a creative, a creative career and that, what, that, I'm, that if there's any purpose for listening to people like me talk, it's to say that there's a much, whatever comes after us, that, that our legacy and our contribution will be how interesting, engaging, amazing, the things, the extraordinary work that will come after us will be. So I look forward to seeing all of that that happens. Thank you. Bike from Lincoln Center rehearsals of Agneton with Philip Glass Opera through the New York traffic, and uh, so we'll give you a moment um, to. My um, experience, these things normally never work, so I'll be so happy if this dongle works. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I flew on a business plane recently and um, all the businessmen had really old Microsoft computers broken. They had lots of money and bad. And I realize all the us artists are suckers for these Apple things that never work. <laughs> <laughs> We've been scanned. Um, let me see. So, I'm so we, I've come straight from rehearsal. So I had the most perfect day. So this morning, uh, my wife and I, we got up at seven and we cycled and we did ballet class at nine in the morning. And then we, uh, we are choreographing an opera at uh, the Metropolitan Opera House, a Philip Glass opera with 12 jugglers. And then we had half an hour and we started working on a piece which is uh, our homage to the legacy of Merce Cunningham, who's one of my heroes and the piece is called life and we made we started the first we did half an hour in a tiny dressing room and it was the first thing we made and it buzzed me up because i and i realized talking about uh, to me it's those moments in the kitchen where you make a little something 
that we can talk about all the things and you need money. And I think I saw an interview with Merce where he said you need clothes for the artists and insurance and a place for them to rehearse. But at the end of the day, it's not about that. And I think that thing of making something in your kitchen is kind of what it's about, for me anyway. And um, let me just see if this beautiful thing works. It's a VLC playlist. I don't have PowerPoint. Let me see. Chuck. Oh, go on, be nice. Is it playing? Do you see my computer? Oh, wow. Oh, by the way, the, the thing that was showing before, this, this is a, a juggling score for uh, Steve Reipe's clapping music for two jugglers. And it's stayed open. Uh, so uh, my wife, who's here, uh, the, the delightful, ever so talented, Cathy Ulahokkala and I, have run uh, this company. We did originally call it Ulahokkala, and it was harder for people to pronounce. So I guess in a sign of empire, it has been named after me, but it's very much my wife and I. And we've been making pieces for 30 years. When we started, there was very, very little contemporary circus. And for me, what contemporary circus is, above all, uh, I feel a lot of contemporary circus is, I, I've always adored circus and classical circus, but I feel like, and a lot of contemporary circus is just classical circus disguised, pretending. <laughs> and it's all exactly the same, and I love it, but it, but it is naughty, naughty contemporary circus. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of naughty contemporary circus. But uh, for me, one of the things that's really exciting about contemporary circus is opening to disciplines, different disciplines, and the fact that the discipline in itself is interesting. I feel like circus is 17 random disciplines. Why those 17 disciplines and not the other 804? It's funny, they go, that discipline is in? No, you out. Mm -hmm. um, and juggling is considered one of the circus disciplines. So from that point of view, we're circus, but our interest in juggling has always been filtered through the aesthetics of dance, dance and mathematics. So I feel sometimes closer to a ballerina or William Forsyth, or somebody that's writing trigonometric equations than I do to a beautiful sear wheel, or I love flying trapeze, but I know absolutely nothing about flying trapeze. So for me to claim I'm from the same world would be being an imposter. So we made 30, 30 pieces over 30 years, and about 10 years ago, we made a piece about Pina Bausch. We made it in a week, blah, 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 piece made, boom, and we thought it wouldn't live, and for some reason it's become this slightly, I hate the word iconic, but it is, it has become our piece, like, like the, like the, the hit, is it, is that the word? That's the word. Um, uh, which disturbs me because it's one of our least us pieces, but it's become us because we do it so much. Um, so I'll show you a trailer for that. We had a, 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 an amazing experience with Dominique Merci, who's one of the main dancers with Pina, who came and worked with us. And this was a rework we did for 20 people. I hope this works. I've been saying it's going to work, go on, be nice. I had the most, like a triple espresso before coming, so my hands is... <laughs> <laughs> hey, it works, yay! Um, I always wanted... Uh, and for our first ten years, we were very academic, very anti-narrative and anti-theatre. And then at a certain point, we embraced theatre, so this was our little uh, um, hello to theatre. Next year is a smash 10-year uh, anniversary, so we're hoping we do this big verse. This was a bit of a crazy. Kim's here doing Akhenaten. Uh, Lots of the people here are in Akhenaten. She was a fantastic pregnant opera singer. We need to work more with pregnant opera singers. That was a controversial scene. We don't need necessarily to talk about controversy, but... Um, I'll probably run out of time, so I'll stop it. Um, doesn't want to stop, I'll let it just go. Um, after, after we made that, we made a, a trilogy of pieces which are love affairs, Tinder dates, Tinder dates between juggling and some of the, the empire arts, the classical art forms. So we made a piece that's uh, juggling, talking with ballet, and I wish it would stop. <laughs> But this is it. And this was an imagining if Louis XIV, who's the, the, fa the hypothetical father of ballet, had liked juggling instead of ballet, we would have juggling houses around the world and ballerinas doing street shows. Uh, and it would be a kind of a fictitious. And so this for us was a little bit imagining, you know, in ballet, they go, this is proper, this isn't proper. And it's such a small difference. And I would love it if you had, no, 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 incorrect way to begin the five balls. Five balls must be begun like this. <laughs> and so it was a little bit imagining what juggling would be like in this context. 
And we then made a trilogy. I know it sounds uh, rather pretentious. We made a trilogy. <laughs> Triptych. <laughs> quadrilogy. Um, and, it, and it's three of the empire art forms. Ballet is one of the, the, the empire. Ba uh, um, and it was a little bit looking at the traces that... Uh, this is a deconstructed, very mathematical pattern. How the traces, the watermarks that one art form can leave on the other. This was the first of, of the trilogy. I actually don't know how to go to the next. I would love to go next. Mm. Yeah, well, somebody... I should be. Jugglers are supposed to be nerdy on computer. This is spring. We're playing spring in New Jersey, Montclair University. Yay! And Jen is here from... And this is the third part of the trilogy. It's, it's juggling and contemporary dance. And it's the most lived in. It's more than a Tinder date. Maybe they moved in together for like a couple of months. Uh, and it has... We commissioned music. And maybe I'll stop it. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. Um, and then we made a, a middle piece uh, which is juggling and classical Indian dance. And classical Indian dance is funny because it's part of an empire but not our empire. I'm, I'm hooking onto your empire. Um, uh, we've also had a collection of good, bad reviews. And uh, it was interesting, now jugglers at the opera, uh, somebody, the Met, uh, about a couple of weeks, put something up saying we have these jugglers at the opera. Philip Glass, and underneath, I went, oh, let's get some, you know, you get internet love, a bit of it. Somebody likes your Instagram post, ooh, love, love, love. And then there was just no love. It was just, oh my God, Philip Glass's music is so boring. And, and then, I, it, in a way, it invigorated me, because it made me realize how much work there is still to be done in convincing, I mean, it's random which art forms are high art or low art, but convincing the world that some, uh, that the things we do could be considered high art, and not that one has anything against the low arts, ventriloquism and whatnot. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I, there, there's a man in my gym who, who loves juggling, but he hates ventriloquism. He's an elderly, <laughs> and he always comes up to me and says, you haven't seen any of those ventriloquists, have you? So, oh. and it always makes me think they are the lowest, you know, jugglers, acrobats, uh, you know, bad ventriloquists. I don't know how to go next, so I'm just gonna go. Um, I think that after this, I just wanted to show you two minutes. We made a piece uh, a few years ago that um, acrobats are always very in, in the erotic sphere of circus. And I wondered what, if, what was the eroticism of jugglers or, or the, the more perverse side. And it was a piece that got, it was very controversial. So I could show you just a trail. He's wonderful. He, he's Wes Peden and he comes and guests. He will be in Montclair. A bit of a rather extraordinary juggler. I would like to go next, but I don't know how. <laughs> Let's see what comes next. I think it's Clowns and Queens next, but let me see. Let's see. I'll let, just for, uh, for something different. Uh, and I guess what we've been doing is, is these dialogues. We love collaborating. We love being in a studio with somebody new. That kind of buzzes us up. Um, so this is the most pure circus thing we've done. And uh, we got some money off an English uh, group to research uh, body parts as experimentation for outdoor art, but we didn't tell them which body parts. So we made a series of peanut colored penises. And then when we showed them that they, they didn't want to, they, well, that was the end of that collaboration. But <laughs> <laughs> it was a shame because it was kind of fun material, but. Um, So uh, there's also um, markets. We, we tour a lot in France, and in France, circus is programmed as the poetic thing. So you have a dance show that can cross barriers, you have a theatre thing, and then a circus, even if it's edgy, has to fit into the poetic category. And I guess this didn't fit into the poetic enough. And it, has, it had this beautiful scene, uh, these surgical tables with uh, uh, Doreen, who's here, did an amazing text about juggling the inner organs of the body. It's kind of very Rem Rembrandt. Uh, and I think it was quite a tortuous journey for Doreen to talk about the, the organs and the juggling. And, but this kind of referred to all of that. And then I will stop after this. There was naked men as well, but uh, yeah, you can't put them up on the internet as much. <laughs> <laughs> and just as a, a fun aside, the, the, um, oh no, I can't leave it on that. <laughs> I'm frightfully sorry. Uh, the, um, yeah, that's the time. The, <laughs> a little bit more. Uh, 
But that's it, really. We, we, uh, the, the main thing uh, is we absolutely love making things, and uh, we're making about three things at the moment. And we're at the Met. I, I'm a, a little bit... The other night, I went to watch Orfeo and Eurydice, and then a screen came up, and I'm a choreographer, and I went, oh, I wonder who the choreographer on that is. And it went, Sean Gandino, and <laughs> no. how, how, how do you get to the Met? But uh, it, 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 I, I don't know if there's rhyme or reason. When we started out for about three years, everybody was going, what the fuck are these people doing? Um, and I, I feel like as long as we remember to occasionally get that reaction, then we're doing the right thing. That's enough, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, please. And it worked. And it worked. So, uh, Gypsy, here we go. Hi. I'm going to take a slightly different approach, one that does not involve visuals. Um, because I simply didn't bring any with me. Uh, and I'm also going to try and address a little bit some of the conversation that he happened here this afternoon. Um, in a way that people who just showed up for this can understand. So I'm Gypsy Snyder. I am one of the Seven Fingers. The Seven Fingers is a collective of seven directors. Originally, we were seven artistic directors, friends, colleagues, people who had performed together for years. And we founded the company in Montreal in 2002 um, with two very clear ideas of what we wanted to do. The first was to create a show that we would write together as seven people, that would feature us as seven people, but that would also um, really force us to create together, which was not something that we had experienced so much in our careers. And the second vision for the company was to create a company where the seven of us could fulfill any and all dreams and fantasies of being creative, whether it meant from the spoken word, to music, to circus, to movement, to anything. The, the company was really to, to just create an infrastructure within which to create on any level. And we were really, really very clear about those visions and continually over the last um, 17 years have continued to renew our commitment to each other. I should mention that after two years, one of the seven actually decided to go off. The youngest one, she decided to go off and have a child and continue with her own career and touring. And she was then replaced with um, an administrative director who really uh, had lived a world in the empire with a tie and uh, was an entrepreneur and someone who'd was very, very far from the creative world, but felt a creative burning inside of him. And he replaced her and facilitated our business model. And I hate to use that word because I really believe he, he his whole idea in joining us was to be as liberated and creative as we were with what he uh, specialized in, which is business and communications and actually political science. Uh, so the collective became six artistic directors and one doctor of political science and entrepreneur. <laughs> and uh, to work in a collective and to commit to six other personalities the way that I have in the last 17 years is a challenge that um, I can say requires a level of sacrifice and a level of commitment and a level of um, creative collaboration that very few people that I know have actually done and actually achieved something from in over a 17 year process. And it's something that I now can never see myself walking away from. And it's something that um, creatively it's really challenging for anyone in this business to evolve your voice and to speak from your truest, darkest, and most beautiful spaces, but then to actually be able to collaborate and give your body, heart, and soul to the people around you and accept their 
energy and darkness and beauty and voice as well to then create a third thing that is neither yourself nor that person, but something beyond you, is absolutely the vision of the company and it's become now my creative mantra. Uh, when I come in to create a show, I definitely have an idea and I have a voice and I have something that I absolutely want to say, but I cannot create that vision without the voices of all of those people that are creating it with me, specifically the artists, the set designer, the lighting designer, the stage manager. There's a whole community that goes into making a show. So I think for me the creative process has been how can you nurture every single individual within a room to be as expressive and true to themselves as possible while delving into a world that is not my world, it is not their world, it is a world that we can only create together. That has become the mantra for the Seven Fingers and in every piece we do. Um, we come from circus and circus is in and of itself a rebellious form. It has existed for a very long time and is very rooted in traditions and um, ideology, there's so much imagery and power within the circus um, that dates back to generations and I'm often very, very surprised to what extent contemporary circus doesn't necessarily root itself in that the way that dance maybe would or theater would. And I think that's because in and of its nature it must be rebellious. Of course when we define ourselves as artists we sometimes have to negate Art. We have to say, well, they, this person did it this way, so I am now rebelliously going to do it this way. And that's what makes me unique and individual. But I take great comfort in um, knowing that actually contemporary circus is something that has existed for a very, very, very long time. And that is because I define contemporary circus, and I think the other fingers would agree, that um, contemporary circus is when you use a form or a discipline um, to express an idea or an emotion or to paint a picture, uh, an idea, or to stimulate the audience in to emotionally open their hearts or their minds to something that they hadn't realized before, they were not aware of before. So, wow. <laughs> uh, I feel that I, I need that, it nourishes me, it keeps me going, and it, and it, it dictates, um, I don't know, I, I actually I think it's something that I need in the world today to sort of understand that right now time is moving much faster than it's ever moved before and people are having a much more difficult time actually um, communicating and coming together even though communication has been facilitated to levels that are beyond our actual comprehension. So to actually get into a room and sweat with someone and be with a group of people building something that might seem very small is actually incredibly powerful and comes from something that has a very long tradition. So I, I feel rooted in that. And I think that we all can feel rooted in that even though I completely support the rebellious forward thinking going into an empty dangerous and risky space. Um, that said, I, uh, where the seven fingers is going is interesting. I'm about to be 50 and my children are about to leave the home uh, in that direction and I'm, I'm trying to place myself in a world where when we created the seven fingers, there really wasn't a lot of contemporary circus. Obviously France had um, really opened the doors to what was possible. Now, uh, I, I think a little bit, Yaron said this as well, there's this feeling of hoping that I've opened some doors and that the Seven Fingers have created a world within which other people can move and play and be excited. Um, I definitely know that Everyone here has done that for this incredible art form. Um, 
you know, some of the places that Circa is playing, Seven Fingers has never played before or would never have even considered it because he's opened a, a, a door to an idea of movement and circus in a completely different way. Uh, the same with all the visuals that you see from Gandini and juggling. It's the idea is that each individual one of us should be using our voices to open these new doors. And this, this idea that I need, when I go to a show, I need to feel that I'm being stimulated. From the moment I open the door, from, even from the moment I buy the ticket, or see the publicity to go buy the ticket, or hear from someone else, the idea is that I'm actually being challenged, and not placating, or um, just rest, staying, swimming in the realm of art that we know or that makes us feel good or that's life affirming and empowering. There's a lot of words that we tend to fall back on in circus because it is um, such a family friendly sort of art form. It actually can be used to really make people feel and think and, and, and open their hearts and minds to possibilities, things that even the artist or the creator are not able to grasp. So I think that that's definitely a responsibility of contemporary circus to keep pushing, um, to open those cracks and to get in there and to be uncomfortable and to fail. I love that we've all been victims of criticism, uh, but that criticism is because something has rubbed the audience in a way that is challenging them. Um, and, I, and I, I, I personally love that. I love being uncomfortable. And I think the seven fingers, if there's anything that we just continue to do with our age is to put ourselves in rooms that are challenging. Um, so that's all I have to say. And there's no visual behind it, but there you go. And, uh, Jennifer. Yeah. Thank you. Grab my visuals. Yes, use this to be recorded. I wrote some stuff out so that I wouldn't. Take your time. Leave. Oh, I'll take my time. Great. I'm not going to start until you have your pages. I'm ready. Am I on the. Okay, good. Hello. Um, so I'm Jennifer Miller. I direct this circus called Circus Amuck, which is um, a New York based, free, one ring, no animal, queer, political circus spectacular. Um, <laughs> I, we uh, originated and developed in the same building as Stephanie in the Bindlestiff uh, Circus that we talked to earlier. So we all come out of this circus building in Brooklyn. Um, we do shows in the parks all over the city annually. We do a month, we do f four different parks a week. So we go to 16 different parks, that's 16 different populations, 16 diverse neighborhoods, 16 different publics and that many more counterpublics every year. Um, we've been performing this festive revolutionary theater to, per, to uh, use a Claudia Orenstein, a CUNY person, I think, term in the park since 1994. Um, each of our shows has a social justice theme. So uh, the environment, immigration, uh, healthcare, housing, climate change, of course, and many of these we've cycled back to because they've become you know, incredibly important in the 80s and the 90s and the aughts. Um, we use traditional forms, and I'll show you in a minute. You know, there's jugglers, there's stilt dancers, there's acrobats. We, there's a brass band, there's a ringmaster. I'm the ringmaster, though, not in the sideshow. 
Um, we also use less, less conventional elements. Um, and you know, we're seeing circus as interdisciplinary here. We're bringing in big puppets, we're bringing in uh, text, uh, sometimes plot, sometimes not, sometimes a postmodern dance, every now and then a ballet. Um, we come, well here I'll show, we come from, you know, our, our, our political theater influences are um, from the Bread and Puppet Theater, who we need to, to, to bring into our circus realm as we talk about these circus disciplines, to, uh, to Ringling Brothers, um, to the Pickle Family Circus. My first circus was Make a Circus in San Francisco, to the Bindle Stiffs. Um, queer theater, you know, very influenced by, by the New York drag scene, uh, the Red Theater of the Ridiculous, Ethel Eichelberger, Happy Face. Uh, worked in clubs, worked in theaters, worked as a dancer, and brought it back out into the parks. I'm going to show you just a little bit so you can get a sense before I go on. Um. Now, we're ready. Go the way. The it's the South Bronx, St. Anne's Park. <laughs> Tompkins Square Park. South Williamsburg. Drag. <laughs> the Empire will never have us. We don't worry about how to get there. Healthcare. It's not just political theater shtick, it's dancing teacups. <laughs> Take care of yourselves, drink herbal tea. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop this here, or actually we could turn the volume down. Can I do that or can you turn that all the way down while I go on a bit? So I wanted to just give you that introduction, but what I really wanted to talk about, because what I think of the singular thing that, that Circus Amok does, is we're queer, pu we queer pu public space. We talked about sort of queerness and queerness in the club, um, you know, family entertainment, not family entertainment. Queer sanctuary tends to be in the club. Uh, public space doesn't really want us. Um, and we don't want to go out there because we're going to get bashed, you know. Uh, as, as advanced as all things are, I was a little afraid coming here tonight in my skirt, as I am when I go out in my skirt and dress. Um, we are free, we, we don't try to elevate circus to an art. I always kind of feel like we're faking circus, actually. We're a bunch of circus performers who are pretending to be circus performers. That really tends to be what we do. All of our juggling acts are like in drag as if we're being like street jugglers or Las Vegas jugglers because I was so traumatized by the misogyny of all of that when I was growing up. So it's circus about circus in many ways, and it's circus. Um, we... Uh, you know, and when I talk about, about queering public spaces, I'm gonna to go to Munoz and queerness as an ideality. We can feel it as the warm illumination of a horizon imbued with potentiality and making it our magic queer spaces. That's what we wanna do. This was a millennium piece, but we hear the text another, another time. Um, when we wanted to go outside and had all these, you know, confronted the fears of, of, of of getting gay bashed and self-censoring, we found out that that didn't happen. This was a piece we did years ago called the Amnesty International Report in which we talked about uh, people of color who were shot by the New York City police. I don't remember what, this, this, uh, what year this was, but it was at least, at least 15 years ago. And here we are in this moment again. That's Sarah Johnson from Lava, Adrian Tresca, lots of great circus people in there. Um, but what I want to do uh, now is actually I'm going to turn this off and talk about how we specifically queer public spaces. Um, and I'm going to do that by showing this clip, Command F. So this show we were doing that's what, uh, was um, in 2006, I think, if I can find the right page. Um, there was an anti-immigration bill up at that time. 
uh, as we have now. There was a huge outcry in the streets, and we like to work with actual political work that's happening at the time. We like to, to imagine that we're actually going to affect change by uh, raising energy, by asking questions, by giving information. So at the same time, our political allies, uh, Jayfridge, were working with, to, to organize domestic workers, to get domestic workers' rights, nannies and health, house, uh, health cl cl house cleaners, and they were mostly immigrants. At the same time, because we're always looking for a little hope, it was the moment of the pink tide. So it was the moment when all of these socialist leaders came into power in South America. Kirshner, uh, Michelle Bachelet, uh, Lula, and at that time that was, that was very exciting. And it, you know, it's gone back and forth, but it was. So here we have, uh, in, this, in this show, these group of nannies, that's what you see here, who are putting their circus act back together so that they can go to Argentina and get health care. Um, <laughs> so we'll watch that, and then I just want to parse a little bit about how gays are used, how audience plants are used, and how gender is represented in Circus Amok. So I've come in near the end of the juggling act here. That's Michelle Matlock, by the way. She just came off 10 years starring in Cirque du Soleil as a A what? What was she? A ladybug. The famous ladybug. and they move closer and closer to the stage and then we realize eventually that they're part of the company and they all this immigration is a scapegoat issue and we see the goats from the earlier goat act come out 
Now I just want to take one more minute if I can because in my mind I think, well, everyone wants to know how to queer public spaces, right? And so I have to serve that a little bit. It's not just that we're out and we're nice, right? We're not here, we're here, we're, we're get used to it. That wouldn't, that, that wouldn't work. So well, I just could take one second to, to go into the strategies that we use to destabilize the heteronormative center and to create a queer utopic space, which is fun for the whole family. <laughs> Number one, we got a ringmaster as a lady with a beard, not in the sideshow. Usually the ringmaster is the interlocutor, yes? This is the norm. This is the one that, that says, it's okay, people, you're with me. I'm going to take you into this world of extraordinary bodies and magical people. But I'm the norm, and we're all together. So hooray, let's join in on, on that together. It's all a little slippery. And look at the bodies. We don't know what's what and who's who and what gender anybody is from the beginning. It's very slippery. So now I'm going to use slippery as our definition for queerness. Slippery is that thing that destabilizes and opens up us up to who knows what potential futures. The story is slippery. The main characters want to leave the country even though the agenda of the show is about the right to stay. Um, Though we live in this queer world that we're creating, the gays are not the good guys, right? The bourgeois lesbian performers are the bad, uh, uh, parents are the bad guys. So our, in this case, our strategy is to contest heteronormativity and homonormativity um, uh, by the fact that, you know, it's not just about the dykes can be moms too, but we place them there and then we make them racist and bourgeois. Uh, resisting stabilizing gay identity or even valuing this identity character um, over anything else. And then there's me. I go in and out of character, even asking the audience what voice I should use. Should I, should I talk in the character voice? So they become directors. I ask them to bring in their immigrant history. I ask them to think about how we should make the theater. Uh, and then there's the audience plants, two layers of them. Um, who open up the discourse. So who's the audience, who's the actor, who's in charge? The rules are broken open. There's cracks in every circus, and these are cracks through which the story erupts, but also cracks through which the audience slides in. Becoming citizen players in the queer sanctuary that we're creating out in public space together. We create this world, we welcome them in. Ta-da. <laughs> So, uh, Patrick, you worked for a long time on the book on contemporary uh, circus, so tell us a little bit about your work. Okay. Patrick, of course, is also one of the co-curators, together with Ruth, um, for this day at the a day at this circus at the Seagull. Right. Okay, so, uh, first of all, wow, tough act to follow, mm -hmm. uh, all of you. Uh, th thank you, thank you uh, to the artists um, who, who presented and who shared their insights. Um, and thank you, Frank, for... Um, having all of us here, uh, Ruth and Frank, uh, for basically making this possible. Um, we initially spoke in the summer very um, briefly, and I said, yeah, we've got this book coming out, maybe I can talk to your students about it. And a few months later, we've got a whole day. <laughs> wow, uh, thank you. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about this issue of um, contemporary circus. We, during the afternoon panel, uh, a number of you talked about this as well. I said, what, what is contemporary circus? And, like, seriously, what, what, how do you think they define contemporary circus? Uh, you know, Philip Astley, uh, 1760s, they, they called it the modern circus. It was modern, it was new, it was different. You know, they're bringing horses and acrobats and, and you know, mi military acrobats, you know, gymnasts already, that, that, that was a strange proposition. And, and a few clowns were introduced, uh, especially in France. Uh, what was contemporary circus in France in the 1830s? Well, it was basically the idea of constructing uh, circuses, the cir des circonsures. Uh, hard circuses. Uh, so they basically created a whole network of circuses. Um, in the US, you know, late 19th century, early uh, 20th century, uh, what was the contemporary circus? Well, it's what, what has become a sort of nostalgic sense of circus uh, now. Um, but contemporary. So you'll see I've got a, a number of images that I, I sort of put in a paradox. So you've got Guy La Liberté when, when uh, uh, he still had hair, uh, <laughs> throwing, uh, fr fire throwing. And uh, Joanne Le Guillaume, uh, with you know, what looks like matches. Uh, and it was an interesting paradox uh, to, to illustrate. 
Um, so what, what do we mean by uh, contemporary circus? Well, the French uh, who like to theorize and who have been doing it for uh, 40 years now uh, give us a specific date, right? They, they say, oh yes, a contemporary circus of course comes after Nouveau Cirque, which was you know, late 70s, 80s, and uh, in 1995, uh, Hungarian director Josef Nacz uh, directed a show at the Knack in Chalon Champagne, uh, Le Cri du Caméléon, The Cry of the Chameleon, 1995, that's when it started. But it's, you know, but seriously, like, once you start digging, once you start actually looking into this, um, you realize that there are different strata, different ideas of how we, how we define this. Um, so is contemporary circus merely of its time, basically uh, based on a historical temporality? Uh, or is it of its time in the sense that it's our era zeitgeist? So are we tapping into something essential in what we do here? Or is it also at the same time? Because there, are, there is a, a traditional circus, of course, and various forms of traditional circus that coexist. So, so we're in a sort of logic of co-temporality as well. Um, I, I know, I see you're thinking, yeah, that's not satisfactory. No. We, 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 do, we do contemporary circus. We, we do something that more, more than that, more than co-temporal, co complicit uh, uh, circus. And so with my colleagues, uh, Katie uh, Lavers uh, and John Burt, uh, so this is a copy of what we ended up doing. Um, so two Australian scholars, who, um, who had the uh, pleasure of working with um, across continents, across uh, oceans, um, we started thinking about this. So how, how, do we, how do we actually think about the contemporary circus, articulate it, explain it as well? Because I am a professor, I end up in all sorts of situations where people say, yeah, so what's this, you know, what's this circus research? What, what, like, what do you mean, like Serge Soleil? Like, what do you mean exactly? I end up in South America, uh, and they define uh, contemporary circus as cirque uh, social, so um, art for social change, uh, but in the matter of Serge Soleil, sort of trained um, um, uh, trainers uh, who bring this sort of, uh, I, I guess, uh, theatrical, uh, theatricalized form of circus there. Their sense is very different as well. So, what we decided to do is to start interviewing um, as many people as we could, basically, uh, rather than to come in with, a, uh, with an answer, uh, rather than to come in with a, a sort of articulate uh, you know, theorization. We thought, well, let's, let's base this on grounded theory. Uh, let's talk to as many people as we can. Uh, we had a few criteria. Uh, we wanted it to be, um, uh, we wanted a gender parity. Uh, we wanted uh, people from as many uh, continents as we could. Uh, South America did not end up in, in this book, unfortunately. We have a number of interviews, but uh, they will be in the next project. Uh, and I feel there's a lot more work to do. Uh, so we interviewed uh, 24 circus artists. And what did we realize? Well, we realized that um, the portrait was a lot more complex than we had, we had ever imagined. Um, we heard extraordinary, um, basically, takes on 24 different perspective of what contemporary circus is and can be, not should be, can be. So there's a, there's a sense of potentiality uh, that's extremely strong here. Um, there's also a number of paradoxes. Um, so we, we heard uh, quite a bit of discourse uh, about uh, being on an outsiders, basically, sort of outsider position, but also hearing that uh, circus really works out best uh, when you actually have infrastructure, when you have uh, support, when you have funding. In other words, when you are uh, integrated into a sort of normalized funding structure, as we've seen in Quebec uh, since 2001, as, we, as we've, have we have seen also in France uh, over the s similar uh, period, but uh, slightly before that as well. What did we notice as well? Uh, there's a great artistic diversity uh, in form, voice, and narrative. Um, a few other paradoxes um, that came up, there, there was a sense of, um, I, I guess, contemporary circus artists being more autonomous, uh, less linked to families, and being pr quite proud of their uh, do-it-yourself sort of ethos. Um, but at the same time, during the same era, you've got a spe hyper specialization of schools. You've got a new school in Philadelphia, you've got you know, uh, C C Circle Media in Bristol, you've got the uh, National Circus School in Montreal, you've got the, I could, I could go, go on, but you, you have these, these elite schools basically growing and imposing uh, a certain 
certain number of, um, I guess, specializations, but also trying to bring artists to their full potential. But it brings up the level. And, and this is something that a certain number of artists also uh, uh, express. The level keeps uh, going up every single year. So what do we do? How do we, how do we compete? How do we fit in that? Well, you don't. You, you adapt in, in a different way. Uh, you rethink your relationship to the apparatus. You rethink your relationship to uh, new work development. You rethink your relationship to the normate. Uh, do we need 20-year-old uh, live uh, 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 white bodies always on stage? And you, you saw this afternoon the Quebec companies. You know, it's, it's often five, five, six guys on stage, perhaps one female or two. Um, and, and so what we're realizing um, also worldwide is you know, we, there are a number of companies that are questioning this. So the grand conclusion, I guess, that we, we came up with uh, with this, the, this first uh, exploration into contemporary circus, which was supposed to be called contemporary circus or, or and the art of contestation. Uh, but the publishers would have none of it. Um, <laughs> so it's been branded, uh, you know, sort of blended, I, I should say. Um, <laughs> contemporary circus. So. We, we, this isn't the authoritative book on contemporary circus. Uh, this is one take, uh, drawing on those 24 interviews that were generously uh, given by uh, extraordinary artists. Um, some of the interviews were absolutely moving. Um, we, we conducted them, basically all three of us at different moments, not always together. I, I did, like, for instance, I did the ones in, in, uh, in Europe mostly, in, in France as well, uh, because it was easier because of language. Um, but essentially, uh, we come up with a book with four sections. Um, so questioning um, mastery through the apparatus, uh, contesting the normate uh, through a, a circus and politics uh, section. Um, I guess moving from superhuman to vulnerability to human to human relationship in performers in contemporary circus. And finally, the move from uh, act-based circuses uh, to more uh, exploded, atomized spaces in uh, the last chapter, new work in contemporary circus. Um, I guess I'll stop there because we're really running uh, late and I, I'd like us to have a few minutes to, uh, to exchange with everyone. So thank you. you uh, one more okay, well, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> and this was on the timer thing. Circus <laughs> artists know their timing, I have to say. So, uh, so I say let's all come up uh, here and um, let's have a. bit of time um, and, and maybe uh, first of all really thank you all um, for coming I think this is one chair too much I have, this is for the future circus artists in New York uh, who hopefully will come out of this um, um, and just uh, to, to begin uh, with a question you what is a question you wish you would be asked as uh, you know as a theater artist and what you normally um, don't get asked so I'm going to give you the mics and also um, put them on so what is maybe we can go you know we start with you what do you feel is um, right. Yeah. What, what I wish somebody would ask me what the question I wish I would <laughs> get asked was, and I'm a, I'm a satisfied man. <laughs> well, I feel you know often I, I I do think circus arts you know as you said it's, it's you talk a lot about the peripheries the edges you know we are not part of the kingdom. Um, and um, meanwhile, I think the engagement uh, with the body on stage, the dramaturgical work of the Cirque Nouveau, is, of the Cirque Nouveau or New Circus is quite a, a significant, uh, quite a significant. So how do you approach, for example, with you, you work at an opera, how do you approach this different than, let's say, a show on the, 
on the street. Actually, of I think it's exactly the same. And, and bizarrely, I think Cathy and I were saying the other day, we did a show in Venezuela a few years ago, and it was a little school show, and there was all these lovely little kids there. They had they combed hair. And we got so nervous because it felt so important to work for these kids, and it was just a favor we were doing to a friend. And sometimes that's more important. The opera is just the same. I mean, like uh, Yaron said, you have seven stage managers, and we're not allowed to touch our own balls. So if we need to move seven balls from one side of the stage to another, it goes through four people and they move them. That's the main difference. I don't think I would want to live in that world where you can't touch your own props, but it's the same, really. It's exactly the same, <laughs> just framed differently. So, so for you, if you work on your, your Orenici of, of the opera, or for us, how do you approach it? How, is it what, how do you approach that work? Um, I, I don't know that I really have an answer. I think you, um, you try and find a way in. Um, uh, you stare into a void for a long time and you see the imminent collapse of your career, the uh, <laughs> hunger in your child's eyes, the <laughs> lack of your mortgage payment. You think, how am I ever going to do this? Uh, and then somewhere you, you learn to attune to a kind of a music that you hear, a sort of something that's like a, a little whisper. And you try and kind of get it to tease it out of the shadows and maybe it comes to you and sometimes it does and often your conscious kind of processes kill it. They just sort of take over and you think, oh yeah, that's great, we've now got it. And then you kind of, and obviously in opera, it's very difficult to go back because you've designed the set and you've made all this stuff happen. However, I, what I discovered inside this recent process was the extraordinary freedom that you have where you can literally say, actually, this scene is gonna change entirely. And I also decided that the one part of the, because usually it's like I do most of the creative functions myself, but I was going to keep the set design, it was going to be me. And that meant that I could say, oh no, the set designer wants this, and that would be great. So it kind of, um, it, allowed, it allowed me to sort of belligerently kind of break my own ideas. I, I, I think that the, the thing for me is that you never know whether it's a good idea or not. You just have to kind of, Trust your instincts and learn from your mistakes. And, and you know, if, you, if you're lucky enough to do this long enough, you sort of get competent. <laughs> um, it's not like you, you know, like some people are just genuinely luminously talented. That was never my lot. My lot was to kind of be good at being able to do a lot of work and just kind of keep going. And if you do that for long enough, eventually people start giving you gigs because you're still there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Gypsy, also a question for you. You talked a bit about you know, having worked for decades. What, what is what you would have liked to know when you started out, what you know now? What is... Um... I think... Um, I th think I would have liked to know more how okay it is to fail. I think that I definitely come from a generation where there were norms, like that was one of my favorite things that Yaron said, was that him coming out from the outside of the world allowed him to, to do things that maybe I would have felt much more constricted in doing having, you know, especially having my parents be in the business as well, um, where, you know, you're looking up at like the Bill Irwins and the Larry Pizzonis and the Jeff Hoyles of the world and going, how do I, or even my mom, how do I match that? That was very difficult and I think you know, instilling uh, total freedom to create your own voice and do it the way that you want to, I think is huge. And I think actually, while on the one hand, I feel like the next generation is so much more courageous, I think actually underneath, there's a lot more fear because the possibilities are so infinite. So dealing with that fear should be one of your first tools. And that's also something that Yaron just said, is that there's this void in front of you that you have to absolutely give into. It's insanely stressful. It's insanely stressful. But you also have tools and work ethic that if you just keep working through the darkness, uh, things just sort of roll uh, pre, you can you just let go of this preconception because you're just working within the darkness and moving forward every day, moving forward. And for me, it's uh, he said music. For me, it's definitely um, tension. I always try to go to some place where there's tension because if you 
can create the tension or live in the tension, then there's gonna be a release at some point. And therein you will have a story. But without the tension, you, there is no story. And so I feel like when I talk about negativity or the void or the risk or the fear, those in and of themselves create tension and you can use them to be creative. You just have to work through it. Jennifer, a question for you to use, to fail, to use tensions, to work through things. Have you been approached by opera, ballet, Broadway, New York City to collaborate? Would you do it? Um, have you? I, I would do it. And back to your question about what, what, what I like people to ask me it would be like, what do you need? <laughs> But yeah, no, I'd love to work in the grand spectacle. So yeah, if I would it, approach me opera <laughs> or the movies. I do feel like movie stardom would be a great soft landing because what we have to do is so hard on the body. And when I'm out in their parks yelling into the void, a big gesture, you know, with the movies, they just come, you just talk. <laughs> Not that I don't love circus and think it's an important art form. <laughs> yes. So, Patrick, in your, in your research, and you interviewed how many circus artists with your colleague? Uh, so, so, 30 initially. We, we retained 24 interviews. 20, for that. Yeah. So, what did you discover? What surprised you? Um, the, the absolute diversity. Um, but, you know, had we interviewed uh, a different set of artists, uh, we would have had a very different book. So I came, I came from the, um, the, the heart of the circus empire, I guess, um, <laughs> Montreal. Uh, I, I teach at the National Circus School. I work on research there. And, sort of, and came so, sort of from a place in the know and that knows best, maybe. Uh, and and I, I don't feel that way, but you know, it's that sort of ethos. And, and um, it was really great because Katie uh, you know, pushed me. Uh, she said, no, no, don't, don't interview too many of the artists you already know. Because I'd done 60 interviews with all, you know, the Quebec scene uh, already. She said, let's, let's go abroad. Let, let, let's go, come to Australia. Come, come you know, let, let's go in, in other places where they, they have a different sense of, of, uh, of circus. And I think that's, that's how we ended up there. Um, there are other, you know, other research projects, other books uh, that, that are in the, um, in the pipeline. Uh, but this one, all of it surprised me. Uh, I knew the work, like I knew that I'd been teaching the work, but, but uh, the articulateness uh, of these 24 uh, artists as well um, just absolutely touched me. Can I respond to that? Because my, my experience of it was almost the exact opposite. I was absolutely astounded by how heinous I sounded in the interview. <laughs> and I, I, I haven't been able to read it since I, I sort of edited it to, to a point where I could potentially see it published. But for me, the thing about circus is actually this kind of pursuit of the ineffable. And even putting it in words often feels like a violation. With all due respect and love. And, y and yet you did. And it sounds better than you think it does. <laughs> Uh, I, I think yeah. one of the big problems with contemporary circus that I'm not sure necessarily New York is feeling, but there is a certain standardization that is happening, and that's not inherent within the form. And that's why I, you know, growing up, what I really remember was always being on the outside of society and, uh, and always wanting to be normal. I always wanted to be a Brady Bunch member, um, but I was living, you know, we were all communists and anarchists and political and and it was it had to be something that was always on the outside so there's a big part of me that kind of just wanted the 80s to come so we could just all become standardized and now what I'm realizing is to that circus is has to watch out for that it really does have to watch out for that well we had a beautiful conference attached to the circus conference in Montreal a couple years ago, which was the circus and its others. And so that's where we began to see the circus. It wants to become a discipline, and then within the discipline, we have the marginalized disciplines. And that was very, very heartening for me as someone who's always felt marginalized within the circus world, to be with other people marginalized within the circus world, and to make that a world. Um, and that was a, you know, I don't know, maybe you can mention some of those. A lot of those companies are in the book, and. And, and that conference actually was uh, extremely instrumental and basically 
uh, opening my eyes uh, to, to the wider world and yeah. the different approaches uh, to so circus making. Yeah. Ruth, um, in, in your work, you now have a significant position. What is your vision? What are you going to change? What will you do different? Or what do you feel is needed right now um, to, uh, in, to take the energy, but also inject um, ideas, visions? Uh, what well, are you do? yeah, I mean, I, um, it's a, I'm in I'm in a gatekeeping position, so um, that's a thrilling you know position, but also dangerous. Um, and I take it very seriously, and also so I think um, I don't know I don't need to go through my whole agenda, but I I I, th I certainly think that um, recognizing. Uh, there's work, there's work to be done for developing audiences for this form. There's work to be done developing um, this, the kind of acumen and awareness and consciousness of um, the field of presenting, certainly for this form. Um, I, I think I'm so, I'm so new to the work I'm doing in Montreal that I don't know, uh, I'm getting still to know what can be done there so I don't feel authorized to talk about that yet. Um, but can I ask a question of, of folks? I'm more, that's my comfort zone. <laughs> um, so one thing that, uh, we were just incredibly lucky to have everyone here for this evening. Um, and so that's kind of the makeup of the panel has to do with everyone being in the book uh, that Patrick edited and also this confluence of people being in town for this particular day and all this. So. Um, but it strikes me in hearing from everyone that in a way we're, you're of a similar generation. And so I'm just wondering if you could, uh, well, you've, both, you've got multiple decades, each of you, of practice under your, you know. So I guess my, my question is um, if you could what, talk about your mentoring activities with, or younger artists that you're helping bring forward or, um, uh, what you're seeing in younger artists and younger companies that's exciting to you, where, I would love to hear that. Anyone who wants to say. I, I could say one thing, does this work? Uh, I, just, uh, <laughs> uh, because we're talking about the new generations and I don't know artistically, but tricks, tricks wise, and I feel sometimes, I get very uncomfortable when we talk, when we get together and talk a lot about circus, because I feel like circus is get, being in the studio and, there's such great tricks. It's the golden age of tricks. I mean, sit like just in our little world, there's so many, so much great juggling, more juggling than ever before. And the acrobatics that's around at the moment, the aerials, the serial tricks, the teeter board, the Scandinavian teeter board tricks. Oh, and I think that is circus as well. I think we get lost in this pseudo poetic, this, that, the other, but it's the tricks and the tricks are healthy. The tricks are so good. The kids are great. We have no worries. The kids are the kids are way better than we ever were. So I think there's no. I think the future is bright, and it's the golden age of tricks. Yeah. But it's true. Even some like some of the jugglers are here. They're all they do crazy things, and yeah. I mean, I'm sure on Instagram you watch they flip and they turn and they've broken the rules. And I mean, how that fits into an artistic concept. In a way, who cares? Maybe, maybe it doesn't need to. In juggling, there's a lot of people that don't, don't perform. They're very, very good. Maybe they're, they're as important. Maybe we don't need to make shows. I mean, he says at the Opera House. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's not just this kind of... And I think, I worry, I love the academias. For me, uh, I used to flirt in the world of dance, artistically. And... Dance has conferences and things, and I said, one day circus will be like that, and have conferences, and now the more circus has conferences, the more I worry that we become, and we, we cover it all in an ocean of, the words are fantastic, but we mustn't drown in, in, a, in an ocean of words. Oof, I, I, I mean, I, I, one of the things that keeps coming back in my feeling here is that, uh, I feel insanely privileged, and I feel like there's a lot of people who were here this afternoon who were talking about circus, contemporary circus in the United States, and what's really tough for me is I feel like a lot of people feel squashed or feel like they have to fight to do what they wanna do, or where's the money, where's the money, where's the money, where's the space, where's the support, where's the money? 
and gigging and trying to make it happen. So I feel it was really difficult for me to talk actually today about um, with the amount of privilege that I have had by actually leaving this country. And now seeing, um, you know, it's I, I see now the United States mostly from the outside, although I try and come in as much as possible. Um, something really interesting is happening. When we created the Seven Fingers, there were not really any other contemporary circuses in North America. And now I feel like every artist that leaves our company starts a company. <laughs> but what they're not really experiencing, which is awesome and incredible, and we absolutely want to support that kind of individual creativity, but what I'm feeling now is the responsibility of having a company and what that means to all the people, for example, who are employed or who um, are seeing the shows and being affected by the shows. Like this, this deeper sense of responsibility that is becoming heavier and heavier um, that I definitely also felt my parents deal with and everyone at Make a Circus and everyone at, at the Mime Troupe, that this deeper responsibility for what art is. And I think if there was one thing I would want to pass on to all those very privileged people who are making their little companies or all those people here who are really struggling just to survive is that there really is a greater responsibility to take care of art in general and that it can't really just be about your voice and you surviving even though that's barely what some people are able to do but it's really about supporting that community around you supporting um, and creating those audiences and, and finding and building a bridge toward, that's why I asked the question today, um, toward your governments and toward your, um, the wealthy people that seem to walk the streets here with <laughs> obscene amounts of money. I moved to Montreal and very quickly found myself lobbying to the government, which was crazy because I was an American on a work visa. Um, and lobbying for it as an art form, but uh, which now I don't even think necessarily is really the mission to be had, but I felt there was a void that, and a movement, and I joined that movement. I did not drive that movement alone. There were a lot of people who got behind it and said, well, not necessarily that we have to be together and create everything together and yada, 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 but participating in finding a way that your work is also giving back to the larger community and, and creating space, which I think for most Americans right now is really difficult because you're actually in a competitive area. And that's not a wonderful place to be. So if I had, oh, I mean, I'm running around in circles, but it's like somebody, w w there has to be some kind of nurturing of art. And, and I know that that, that can only happen if, if, we all, if you all kind of come together and band and form that. Um, and, on, and nurturing the responsibility that that also um, carries. If I may, to answer from the academic perspective, uh, the, the future, what, what I'm hoping for, and what I'm seeing uh, is basically uh, former practitioners or practitioners who are basically you know, in their late 30s, 40s, and thinking, what have, I, what have I been doing all this time? And wanting to basically dig, dig deeper and come with the embodied knowledge of circus. And they're coming, they're doing their masters, they're doing their PhD, and that, that's the future of circus scholarship, I think. It's this actual mixture of both the, the scholarship and the, um, uh, the embodied knowledge. Maybe we go, since we are a little bit on time, um, and two audience questions. Michael, if you could put some lights up. And then at the very end, I would like to maybe ask you all what you dream about. If someone would say, what do you need? And you had <laughs> unlimited means, you know, what, what would you do? What is, your, what is the project you say, this is the, what I um, always uh, would have liked um, to done. But um, we have a great audience here, and um, we need good theater, need good circus. We also need great audiences. And so for you all to come and take your time, thank you for doing that. We, it really means a lot to us. So. Um, are there some um, questions or remarks in the audience? And we start here with the Bond, Bond Street. Yes, my name is Michael McGuigan, and I'm uh, with Bond Street Theatre, and uh, I know many people and are meeting new people. Um, but we come from, uh, uh, Bond Street Theatre is a physical theatre company that has a, a foot somewhat in uh, circus arts. And um, 
uh, ensemble theater and our um, mentors were uh, San Francisco Mime Troupe and Pickle Family, and Bread and Puppet Theater, all those folks that we we're talking about, and even open theater and living theater, which reminded me as we were discussing the ensemble element that I know in the theater world, the artists creating the show, um, they were their own directors and actors and technical builders and prop makers, that ensemble spirit. So I'd like to hear if anybody has any um, comments about how that is working in the contemporary theater as we're hearing it now. How much of it is ensemble and how much is it, oh, they're great performers, let's pull them in and they can do their act as opposed to like creating the show together. Yeah, right. yeah well, our, our, I can only really talk for us. Our model is an ensemble, so we employ 21 artists all year round on a full-time wage, and therefore we commit to pay, you know, $1.6 million a year we don't have, um, and then we have to try and send them out to make that uh, money uh, in a whole variety <laughs> of different ways. Sounds easy. It's, it's a piece of cake. Um, um, and we often don't have money for sets or time for rehearsals because we have to take that other gig or do that thing. But the sense that all our artists are employed on two-year contracts, they get paid the same if they rehearse, if they're sick, if they work. Um, because I think artists have a right to buy a house and to invest in the future and have a family. And one of the things I like most is that most of our company, the ones that stay, it's not for everyone. It's like a forced 21-way marriage most of the time. But the artists who stay, they have mortgages and they have for life. And I think that's a really great gift to be able to offer. And that's the key form of my mentorship. I can tell you the psychological health of every single one of my artists at every single point in time. Uh, and I carry that load. That's my responsibility. Um, in terms of creation, I'm the director. They work with me and for me and we create together some shows quite prescriptive in opera there's a but you're directing there's limited bandwidth for collaboration some of our shows are fully improvised creating a strong culture that unites everyone and a very shared and a strong shared methodology uh, that's based in belief and mutual trust and a kind of psychological safety is incredibly important but also deeply flawed and impossible to achieve I'll answer really quickly because so many of his, funda the way that he works uh, is so fundamentally actually also how we work, which is amazing because I think our shows are completely different. Um, we tend to actually feature um, the acts. We are victims of that. And one of the reasons is because we were all circus performers and the evolution of expressing yourself on a trapeze or juggling within the act to really create that beginning, middle, and end and have the tricks evolve so that you've seen it in one way but then you're seeing it in another way and going to the actual um, full expression of the act is something that we, being ex-circus performers, really value and also want to give our circus performers and we want to give them that platform to speak fully through their dis discipline. That said, we're also an ensemble and many of the responsibilities of the ensemble that um, Yaron has we share, where uh, all of our shows are basically created through improvisations that are guided um, by one of the seven fingers, depending on who's directing. So we will write, direct, and choreograph however movement and character um, interpretation happen completely through improvisation, which then evolves over time. Um, so even if someone's come with an act, we will rewrite that act and restructure it within the global of what we're trying to create as an ensemble. Yeah, we're an ensemble too, and we want everyone to also pay their mortgages and raise their babies. And, and I'm a benign dictator as well, and a lot of it comes through improvisation. <laughs> I never I mean, it's said benign. It's a, yeah, right, 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 right. We didn't um, get this way yeah. through benignness. And so we supply everybody with you know, a thousand dollars a year to go out and, and do that. But that's you know, but we, we do care, and I and I do know about all their psychological well being. You know, so, so. It's almost the same. We just we just need that other hundred, maybe a million dollars a year. One or two more questions or thoughts. Circus talk here, yeah. 
Hi, just a simple question about um, the categories of the book, which escaped me now, and I've read half of it. I know the first one's apparatus, but um, how did those categories come about, and what isn't in there, or what were options of a way to categorize the fabulous information that came from these interviews? Right, so in a nutshell, uh, there's uh, uh, con contesting, basically, um, ideas around apparatuses, um, contesting the normate through uh, politics, so circus and politics, uh, circus and new works. So some of the trends we've been seeing in terms of uh, uh, dramaturgy, in terms of uh, working from the act-based model to to a, to a more hybrid, uh, as I said, atomized uh, uh, model. And what's the last one? Uh, yeah. New creation. New creation. Yeah. No, no, I said that. Sorry, it's been a long. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, I'm blanking out. But um, th th there was a lot of there was a lot of debate, a lot of back and forth, a lot of uh, discussion, um, and this could have been a great number of books, quite frankly. Um, and I think I think that's that's you know, rich. We're, we're in a period where there could have been many books. There can be many books on, on this uh, extremely vibrant um, hybrid uh, art form. Uh, what's what's missing, I guess, is the the, the more sort of normative uh, uh, models of, of, of circus following. A, you know, and, and we, you know you, you've heard me talk about this in other other instances. But l l looking at different uh, meaning making strategies, and but the, that, that's another project. We'll talk about that another time. Good. Maybe one more um, thought question. Where I was going to jump in really quickly with something that addresses a few yeah. things we've heard about future and mentoring and what's missing, which of course is the diversity of our populations and of our work. And so going forward, how do we look internationally? How do we look to the global south to find out what's happening in contemporary circus there? How do we make circus that's meaningful to you know, all of the uh, Americas and, and even in North America in which our, our, our colors and our ethnicities are changing all the time and we need to make space and figure out how to bring uh, people of color into the circus world in much larger numbers and that just goes back to you know all of the segregation and 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 everything that is uh, white nationalism in this country so that people don't come up with the time and privilege to practice these these tricks which we love so much to do self-hating circus person as i am i love to juggle um but how do we how do we break through that the nationalism that we're living with and make all of this work available enticing and affordable uh, to the rest of the population that we don't see represented. Can I say one thing along those lines? Actually, the best, some of the best juggling in the world at the moment is in South America at the traffic lights. And uh, to me, that's very intriguing because I feel sometimes in the first world we moan, I wish I had that grant to make that show and I can't make that because I don't have 15,000. And then they make some of the best work in the world just at traffic lights. So I think if we want to make stuff, we can make stuff, I think. But we also want to eat. So they're doing great juggling, but they're not paying their rent. I, well, I, they make quite a lot of money at the traffic lights, actually. <laughs> <laughs> they do quite well. <laughs> yeah. One more uh, thought, observation, question. Who are? Nikki. You here? Yes. Can you take the microphone, please? Um, this is probably a longer conversation in general, but there's been a lot of discussion of circus being something that um, comes from the fringes or should be the fringes, but I'm curious, really anyone's thoughts on what the role of, like you say, representation, representing what we're actually seeing in our everyday lives, seeing in our communities, like where is, what is our responsibility as artists to be representative and not just make the things that we either dream about or um, would like to see in the world or want to just like give a middle finger to the man or where's, where's the role of representation, I guess? Well, I'll just, add, you know, as the one who's the angry feminist, I will just <laughs> say, you know, for people that want to want to deal with representation, that's great. And people that want to deal with social change in po politics, that's great. And, you know, hallelujah for people who, who don't and are making, you know, beautiful, beautiful dances and circuses. So I think the response, I don't know if the question is responsibility or just the space for all different kinds of work. 
Yeah, I mean, as a, uh, I, I love Yeats's formulation that out of our quarrel with others, we make rhetoric and out of a quarrel with ourselves, poetry. And I think there's, ch there's places for both in the world. I know that my journey is to make poetry and every time I try and tell anybody anything, I tell nobody nothing and in a way that really bores them. So I've worked out that's not my journey. <laughs> I mean, I, I would say today my thing would be that this clearly needs to happen more often. Um, I think that there, it would be great to create spaces where forums could actually happen. And I think when companies like Yarns are here, um, or Gandinis are working, if there's ways to encourage companies to, and I know you guys do this quite often, workshops, forums, so that new perspectives um, can help enlighten communities where they are. Uh, I think everyone needs to make an effort to include diversity in any kind of projects that they're doing, and that just has to become the, uh, the active strength in like, I wanna do this, so I wanna do this with people that I'm not, that I need to find these people and bring them in and build the bridge to making that happen. And um, I, th I think what's really tough in New York City is that it's so much about surviving and not necessarily about um, creating, but I know that there's a community now. I mean, I'm just hearing about House of Yes and what the Muse is doing, like if there's ways that that community, those communities can solidify, support each other, buy tickets to other people's shows when they're going, or not accept salaries or conditions that are actually gonna comp compromise people's health. I, I think there's so many subjects in and in, in around what's happening in New York City right now that could actually be addressed as a community as a whole if there was a forum for that. Well, I hope the day perhaps contributes, you know, to create such a forum as I say again, we would be happy to offer a seminar room here or there uh, once in a while, and I hope that will be done. But uh, the last question to uh, our uh, circus of theater artists, performance artists, if you really could do what you want, someone says it's unlimited, what, what is really, what is, would be a, a project, a vision you have that you always would have liked to do or would love to do, how would that look like? Actually, I have to say I do a lot of what I like doing. I could do it on a bigger scale or with some of my fantasy people, but uh, I, I am quite happy. Like I say, my wife and I work together, we make things in our kitchen. I don't need much more than that. But talk about community, we on uh, next weekend at Brooklyn Museum, we have uh, 40 community jugglers and a choir of 60 beautiful youngsters singing and an orchestra of 70 very good musicians and it's free and yeah, one does do that sort of thing. Thank, thank you. Yeah, is there a project you, I know you work on four or five things parallel now, but is there one among them, or is something you really would love to do? Um, look, I, I think like Sean, I'm very fortunate in that I get to make some of my obscure dreams and fantasies reality. Um, I think what I long for is smaller and more time. I think I would love to have six months or a year with five people in a room, five people who didn't get injured or sick or wig out would be really great. Um, <laughs> but like that kind of scale and time and not lack of pressure and ability to start again. And we've kind of been able to re-humans that you saw a, a little bit of in um, Ruth's thing, the poster. That was kind of a show that was called Untitled for a long time and I took eight, ten weeks and we didn't have a purpose to it. But I think to be able to extend that journey of just following your nose and instincts would be a, a rare gift. I would also have to say I'm pretty much doing the things that I want to be doing and that's it's absolutely, I feel blessed. I also would like to be able to go smaller um, and one of the things that I think I'm fighting with is when I try to really do something different, it doesn't, um, it's, it's, that's not the seven fingers. And so really being able to create a company where we actually can try things that really don't have anything to do with what we did before, I would really love to evolve our reputation to be able to actually try things. And again, as Yaron said, to make them better. Because right now, one of the main problems is that you can create something, but to really um, achieve its full expression or to get good at it, it takes time. So when you try something new and risky, um, you need that time to get it over, over the hump. Well, this is so beautiful that we all really love what we do and feel like <laughs> we're doing it. I mean, that by you know, a queer circus in the park, I'm 
that's what I wanted to do. And, and my answer is also the same, to have money and time to actually get better at it, you know, to not have thrown it together two weeks ago, but to develop it and throw it out and try again and not be stressed and put more skill back in and more research and just to, to, to really let it grow let it, and finesse it. Well, these are uh, wonderful um, answers again. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for coming here. Thanks also Jed, who presenting lots of showcases at Montclair State University is one of the supporters. So um, Ruth, again, uh, for bringing the idea, Patrick, uh, with the book. And all of you, though, really uh, coming out here right away out of the rehearsals, and you happen to be here. You're flying in uh, for it. It really means a lot to us, and I really hope uh, that uh, in a sense of a trampoline, maybe it gives a little uh, jump, that you jump higher than you uh, maybe normally do, and I also hope that the discussion in the afternoon to create something, a little critical mass, and it always starts with baby steps, maybe this is the beginning of it, I would be happy to help, or Jet for sure, or others too. So uh, thank you all for coming, we hope we will stay around a little bit so you can talk to the artists and follow um, their work, and uh, the opera, and go to the Met, and to the circus, and to the Brooklyn Museum. Thank you all for coming. Thank all of you guys for bringing us together.